Praise God. How many are free? Amen. <laughs> are you really free? Yes. Are you glad you're free? Yes. Praise God. You can be seated. The Lord's good. When we consider all the goodness of the Lord and all that he's done, one songwriter wrote, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, how many know that song? How many know the background of that song? Brother Johnny James was a minister, is a minister, evangelist, and uh, his mother was married to a denominal preacher, and she got the revelation of Jesus' name and the Holy Ghost, baptism, and lived an apostolic life because of her belief in the doctrines of her husband were different uh, he disassociated himself with her and she lived in a separate room by herself the rest of her life uh, being married to that man she was ostracized by her husband because she didn't go along with what he was teaching and I guess in a, in a carnal way you can understand that. He should have went to truth. But with that abandonment and with that lifestyle that she chose, it was a choice. Loneliness. She penned the words of this song. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise God for saving me. And what a tremendous blessing it's been to our movement, to those that are associated with the blessings and the mercies of God. But you know, it goes right along with what I want to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about uh, freedom to choose when we make sense of suffering. It wasn't easy for her to live a lifestyle like that and rejected of her husband and still maintaining her walk with God as she believed the scriptures taught. But the reality of suffering seems to be at odds with us sometimes when we think about a good God and suffering along with it. But suffering can be redeemed and is redeemed by an understanding. And when God gives us this freedom of choice, we're free moral agents. We sang a song, we're free. He that the Son makes free is free indeed. He makes us free. And so when you're made free, you have a different status. You know, I, I like the song. I, I'm not criticizing the song. It says he, that the Son sets free. Well, when you're set, if you, if you set a captive free, if you set a slave free, someone else could still capture it. They don't have legal rights. But when Jesus makes you free, it's kind of like, the Apostle Paul was talking to the centurion when uh, they were examining him in Jerusalem, and he made reference that he was born a Roman citizen. And the centurion said, are you truly a Roman citizen? You know, because with a great sum of money, I purchased this right to be a Roman citizen. But Paul said, I was free born. It gave him a different status than anyone else there because he has freedoms being a Roman citizen. God makes us free. He gives us a different status. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so we have that status and we have that position in Christ that we're free, but along with it, there's suffering. And it's hard to relate to that, uh, but sooner or later, you're going to suffer for Christ. If we suffer with him, we're going to reign with him. I know this doesn't fill up coliseums. You don't have mega churches preaching about suffering. It's prosperity and blessings, and, and that goes along with it too. But there's, a, there's an aspect of walking with God in reality. You as children, and you need to know this, and you need to understand and relate to it because you will have to choose to suffer or not. God gives us that choice. And so we're going to look at... Uh, the Hall of Fame in the Bible, 11th chapter of Hebrews, in our, our scripture text this morning, taking our text, we'll be reading other scriptures, Hebrews 11:25, that those were choosing rather to suffer affliction 
with the people of God. Moses was choosing to suffer the affliction with the people of God, then enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. How many know there's pleasure in sin? Sure there is. That's why people do it. But it's a season. It don't last, and the end of it is death. And so we as the children of God, we have to understand these things. And so we, here we have a reluctant freedom fighter, Moses. He's going out now. He's 40 years old. He's, he's been raised in the palace. He's, he's a mighty man uh, of word and deeds, the Bible tells us. He was no slouch in, in Pharaoh's court, but he was, had, he was truly a man of renown. He was a mighty man. He was mighty in word and deed. And understanding from his birth, from a child, when his mother was able to uh, uh, take care of him and, and nurse him until he was time to be weaned from her, uh, she instilled in him a knowledge and an understanding that he was a chosen vessel and that God's hand was upon his life, and he would deliver the people of God from this slavery and bondage that they were in. And so he knew this. He understood this. And at the age of 40, he went to see his people and saw a man, a, a, an Egyptian, beating mercilessly and probably would have killed this uh, uh, Hebrew, one of his relatives. And so Moses intervened and smote the Egyptian and killed him and buried him in the sand, delivered that Hebrew from that injustice and, 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 and that, that terror that, that was inflicted upon him from his taskmaster. And, and so he went back the next day, and he saw some of the Hebrews fighting among themselves. And he goes, whoa, hold on, guys, what are you doing here? And I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> You're fighting one another. You're brothers. You shouldn't be doing this. What's the matter with you? And they looked at us and said, <laughs> Are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Who made you a judge over us? Well, when Moses heard that, he knew the, it, it, the news had spread. and They told on him, and, and Pharaoh heard about it. So Moses fled for his life. He thought they would have understood that it was by his hand God was going to deliver him. That's what he, he thought they understood. He went there presuming that God was going to deliver the, deliver the children of God by his hand. He was the chosen one. And he thought all the Jews understood that, that were in slavery, but they understood not, the Bible says. They didn't understand that. They, they didn't perceive him as a deliverer. Yet he knew within himself, he knew the promise that was upon him, and so he was going to do that. So he, he flees and he goes uh, uh, in in to the land of the Midians, and he's there, and he meets some girls, and uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, and he marries his daughter, and uh, Zipporah, and, and, and 40 years he's there tending sheep. 40 years in the wilderness, a bunch of bleeding sheep on the backside of the desert. So this is a long time, 40 years. That's a good portion of your life. 40 years he was in Pharaoh's palace and joined it, but when he went and saw the afflictions of the people of God, he wanted to intervene. He was rejected by them and Pharaoh. And so now he's on the backside of a desert tending a flock. He's happy. He's got a good family going, and he's got a lot of sheep, and everything's cool. And Then something strange happens. There's a burning bush there, and he's probably seen burning bushes before, obviously, in the desert gets dry and just a strike of lightning or something to get a fire going. California has a lot of problems with fires. And it's dry. and So he sees this bush burning, but this is different. This bush is flaming out, just burning, but it's not burning out. He says, this is strange. He probably sat over a distance from it watching it, saying, seeing which way the fire might spread. You know, you got to get out of the way of the forest fires and brush fires. This is just one bush. And it keeps burning and burning and burning. Uh, hmm. God ever do something to get your attention that's different? Because he's wanting to speak to you? And so he goes over to check this deal out. The 
said, I'm going to go see why this bush isn't burning up. And as he approaches the burning bush, the voice of God calls out from the burning bush and tells him to take his shoes off his feet because he's standing on holy ground. And so that burning bush, it's not a usual thing for a bush to be burning and then talk to you. you know. So, you know, it could, could have been a lot of things, I guess. We could have sort of, my, my, if I'm walking up to a burning bush that's not burning out and then a voice thunders out of it and tells me to take my shoes off, I'm on holy ground, I'd get the understanding that's God talking to me. And that's what Moses did. He understood that. You know, and it's not hard to believe for me. Is it hard for you to believe a bush could talk? Wait, a, a serpent talked. A donkey talked. Sometimes I wonder if the animal kingdom didn't talk before the fall in the garden. Just a thought. Or maybe before the Andaluvian age was full of talking animals, you know. <laughs> Dr. Doolittle everywhere, you know, just talking to the animals. But uh, sometimes I think I can understand my dog even though he doesn't speak he uses sign language <laughs> he does it's like one time he was climbing up on my lap staring at me and then looking at my glass oh, what in the world do you want i thought he wanted to go outside no he just stood there and he went over and sniffed in my glass well he's never done that i thought what are you doing i mean my glass was empty and he just kind of gave up and a little, it dawned on me a little bit later. He was his his water cup was dry, and he was trying to tell me I want to drink a water. That dog was trying to communicate to me. I believe that he wished he could have told me I'm thirsty. Can I have a glass of water? <laughs> but he was doing the best he could to tell me he was thirsty. So they have reasoning, they have understanding. They don't have souls. All you cat and animal lovers and dog lovers, I'm sorry. <laughs> there is no dog heaven. They just go back to the dust. Sorry, you ruin your day now. But uh, I don't want you to be misconceiving that, you know, your, your little peppy's going to be up there or kitty cat. Enjoy them while they're here because they are a joy. So this burning bush, he turns aside and he looks for it. And then God starts talking to him and starts telling him about, <clears throat> I'm going to send you over to Egypt and you're going to go deliver the people. And, you know, he starts complaining to God. Well, you know, God, I'm not a good talker. Well, he was mighty in word and deed. I guess being around a bunch of bleeding sheep just kind of made him a weak speaker, I guess. I don't know. But he's trying to find a reason why he couldn't go. He was excusing himself from doing the will of God. He did not want to go. Though prior, 40 years prior, that his timing and strength, he attempted to do it in his own might, in his own way. Was he wrong in understanding that he was to deliver? No. He was wrong in thinking he could do it his way. And that's where he got himself in trouble. And so God's here, he's, he's, he's talking to him, and, and Moses was learned, uh, Stephen in the seventh chapter of, of, of Acts, it says Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And verse 25 says, And he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So God's wanting them to go back there, and he's saying, Tried that, God. Didn't work. They don't want me. And how are they going to believe? If they didn't believe me the first time. See, he was right in the promise of God but he was presumptuous in how God was going to do it. Isn't that the way we do things? We get a promise from God, and then we try to figure out how he's going to do it. Plus, he had to go back to suffering. How many want to take an invitation and receive it? You know, RSVP, we call you to suffering. You want to go there? So I could see the reluctance of Moses not wanting to go back to that mess. They, they rejected him. He tried it. It didn't work. He's fled for his life. It's nothing but a bunch of sorrow and grief and suffering. And, and, and I've got to, you know, I left all the, the glories and the splendor of Egypt, and it didn't work, and I thought I was the man, and I guess I'm not. And, you know, there you are. Uh, you got a promise of God. It didn't work out for you, so you quit. And then God gets ready to do it his way. 
And then you're questioning God, and you're saying, why I can't do it? When your might and your abilities and your talent and your understanding and your knowledge and your wisdom, you were ready to go do it. But now God's showing you a different way, and we're going to do this thing. And you're saying, yeah, it's the promise, but it ain't the way I think you ought to do it, God. This is not right. You need somebody else because this isn't the way I do it. This is where we have a freedom to choose. We can choose God's way or our way. God will not stop us in our will. That that's really amazes me. When I think of the awesomeness of God and the power of God, Paul says the eternal power. He's awesome. He's real. He's, he's created everything. Nothing exists without the hand of God on it. He's made you. He's made me. We're creatures. Okay? He, he, we have a God who made us, manufactured us. By his, by his own hand, he formed us out of something he spoke into existence. And there's God. He's so mighty. He could just go like that, and everybody stops breathing, right? Or he can go, and there would be no more earth. God, God's, I mean, when you start thinking about the size of the earth in retrospect to the universe, I mean, they have suns out there that they estimate to be the size of our solar system. Our sun's not that big. But they have suns out there as big as the radius of our solar system, you know, from the sun to Pluto. Think about that. That's, they're out there. And, and it just keeps a vast domain of God's creation, that, that universe is it billion, hundred, just I think 17 billion light years now they're saying is what they're estimating, and it keeps expanding, and there's reasons why. It's really neat what theories they come up with, why it has to expand. But not to go into the scientific stuff because I know you bore, I bore you with that stuff. But here's a God that controls all this, keeps it all in harmony, powers it, and your will can push them off. Wow. He will not override your will. I remember Brother J.T. Pugh, uh, minister's session when I first came to Florida. He was in a retreat, and he was talking about an individual that was constantly getting mad, getting offended, staying out of church. They try to work with him, love him constantly, just negative, 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 negative. And he just got fed up with it. And, you know, if you didn't call them, they complained. If you called them, they complained, you know. Nobody calls me. I hadn't been there Sunday, and nobody called me. And so that's bad. And then you call them and say, why are you calling me? You know, it's like you're one of those people that's miserable, and they want to make everyone else miserable. He, he went over, and he knocked on the door, and he said, uh, I'm here to let you know that we love you folks. We're not going anywhere. He said, but I will not be asking you back to church again. If you want to come back, you can come back. We're here. We love you. I want you to know that. But I will not be calling you anymore. I will not be knocking on your door anymore. If you want to come to church, you can come to church. He said, because everyone has a right to go to hell if they want to. Everyone has a right to go to hell if you want to. It's a choice. And so Moses chose the reproach of Christ rather than the riches and the treasures of Egypt. He chose to suffer. He didn't choose to go to hell. He chose to suffer with Christ and with the people of God. And they're suffering with the people of God. We, we have battles that the world doesn't have. Of course, the, battle, the battles of the world are, are sorrow and misery and struggle and, and sins, uh, byproducts and fruit. But, you know, we have, we have spiritual warfare that the world, they, they don't fight the devil. They don't know what spiritual warfare is. How many times have I heard since I've pastored, man, I got baptized, give my heart to God, got the Holy Ghost, and all the hell's fighting me. Yeah, they, they want to drag you back down. You just got to understand that's part of it. You know, it's not for sissies. You're a soldier in the army of God. There's warfare going on. You just can't lay down and give up when the enemy's attacking. They'll overrun you. You got to get up and fight. And so 
the, the choice that Moses made was wise because it, it, it put him in a, a situation where he was obedient to God. Why, why do you think obedience is so important? Why are we not exempt from obedience? I mean, Brother Jones used to say that's one of the biggest words in the Bible, obedience. Not, not in, in letters, but, but in meaning and in, in, in importance. Obedience to God is important. God puts a lot of stock in obedience, and it's important that we understand that. And so, is it supposing to think, or should I say it's too much to think, that Moses, uh, when he saw these great, marvelous ten revivals of the plagues of Egypt coming, and God stretching out his arm and, and flexing his muscle and delivering the people of God, do you think it would be too much for him to think, man, after that it's going to be smooth sailing? <laughs> We got free, now it's going to be all a party. That'd be a reasonable assumption to me. I'd think, man, finally we got through this. We got free from bondage, and man, this is great. We're free, and we're getting out of here, and, and, and we just spoiled Egypt because everybody just borrowed from the Egyptians, and they gave them all their gold and, and raiments and food and everything. Just They said, get out of here. Take it all. We don't want you here. You know, you've destroyed our country with your God, and, 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 and so here they are marching out of there. Pharaoh's army comes back after him, you know, going to fight him again, and God wipes them out in the Red Sea. So <laughs> they're dancing over there on, on the shore of the Red Sea, you know, how God destroyed Pharaoh and his chariots and the horsemen, and they're all buried and washed up on the seashore. Makes you want to look at Remnus and say, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be a king lying washed up on the shore. What's the matter with you? Man, it's victory. So it's going to be good going now. Three days. It's <laughs> they're three days out and they're complaining. Three days. Because the way got rough. And Moses had to endure all that suffering with him. It wasn't easy on the journey to the promised land. Now, the promised land... It's not he a type of heaven. It's a type of the promises of God. And if you're going to get the promises of God, listen to me, this is real important. Pay attention. If you're going to receive the promises of God, many times there's a wilderness journey to get there. And we try to figure out shortcuts. See, the Bible says that the way of the Philistines was easier to get to the promised land. It was nearer. It would have been a shortcut to get there. But God said as soon as they got into battle, they would have turned tail and run. They weren't ready to fight. And so to receive the promises of God, God promised Abraham the land, and he gave it to the children of Israel. That's still in effect today. I don't care what negotiations they want to split and divide and all that stuff. Jesus is going to set his earthly kingdom up there in a, in a relatively short future. And he'll rule out of Jerusalem. And it is the capital <laughs> of the Jews. Jesus being the chief Jew. Okay? So here, here there, you got promises. They had promised. God promised all that. But he didn't take them the shortcut. It took them 40 years through the wilderness to get them ready to possess it. Then didn't give it to them all at once. They had to fight their way in to get it little by little by little by little because God, if God would have gave them, they didn't have enough population there to keep the wild animals down and they would have overrun the country. That was God's reasoning. There's reasons that God doesn't just zap his magic wand and, 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 and the sparkly uh, Disney wand just sparkles all across the sky and says, there. Sometimes he does. I love it when he does that. But most generally, it's a fight to get to the promises of God. Because while you're fighting, God's got other reasons to keep you in a fight. There's things out there that would overtake you if you had it now that you couldn't handle until you grow. And so the fight causes a restraint on the fulfillment of all the blessings that God's promised you so that you can grow into it. They had to grow into the promised land before they could possess it all. 
So in your life, you've got to understand from the time you get the promise, sometimes there's a fight and there's a wilderness journey and it just doesn't happen overnight and there's struggles and there's trials and it seems like, why am I going through all this stuff? And you want to give up, but God gives you the choice, the freedom to choose whether you want to go on or walk away. Moses chose. He chose the route of God. And so your situation is, may be different. But sometimes we are called upon to make painful choices. Everyone say painful choices. With no clear anticipation of pleasant outcomes. There was, there's no clear sometimes guarantees we could say better that everything's going to work out the way you think it's going to work out. God's word is going to work itself out the way he wants it to work out. But your understanding of it might be skewed. Your paradigm might be thinking one direction, but the rea reality of God's promise is this. And God has to bring your paradigm in focus with his reality. And one thing that I've noticed about God is Time doesn't worry him at all. He could do it fast or he can make it a hundred years. If God promises you something, he promised Abraham a son. 25 years later, hello? Did he fulfill it? Absolutely. Did Abraham physically see the blessings and the promises that he got? No, but by faith he did. Sometimes you might possess the promise and never see its fulfillment only through the eye of faith. And that's a powerful concept. God gives you a promise, you believe it, but it hasn't happened yet. You may go to the grave, but God's word is going to be fulfilled. That's happened throughout the Bible. So you have to understand that when God says something, he doesn't worry about lifetimes or timelines. Uh, he, he's not into that stuff. He's eternal. He is. You know, time's irrelevant to God. And so he just marches on and he does his thing. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had to make some choices. They could have bowed. They could have said, nah, <laughs> everyone else is bound, and why should we stick out like, you know, and risk ourselves being thrown in the fire and, you know, God knows we're in a bad situation. God put us in this captivity. They're, captivity. They're, 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 that king's our ruler now. God put him over us. We've got to obey him. But they chose when a king's rule con went contrary with the word of God and the things of God, they chose to stand for God no matter what. So they risked their lives, didn't they? And they, they refused to bow. And so it was when they were cast into the fire. Sometimes you've got to go through the fire, but it won't kill you. The fire literally burned off the bonds, the ropes that had them bound. The fire set them free. And they walked around in the fire with God, and they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them when they came out. You ever been around a campfire? Have the wind blowing you, your clothes, everything? It smells like smoke, you know. You can go into some stores where they're smoking and you come out and you smell like cigarettes. The smoke permeates, doesn't it? Well, they, they were lined up, the sniffers. They come out of there without a singe smell on them. Their hair didn't stink. When it, you ever burn hair? Ugh. Nothing, nothing, no smell. They didn't stink. They weren't burnt. The ropes were gone. They incinerated. The men that threw them in there died from the heat. They made a choice. Now, they chose no matter what. They didn't know the outcome of it. They didn't know that it would be pleasant for them. They didn't know that God would protect them. They just knew that God could, and if he wanted to, he would. But if not, they weren't going to break the law of God. They chose to stand with God's word and not bow down to a false god. And they were willing to die for it. They said, we believe God can do it. But if not, that don't change the story. That doesn't change our commitment to God. If God chooses not to save us, doesn't, doesn't determine whether we serve him or not. 
Some of you won't serve God if God doesn't let everything go your way. Oh, did I say that? Fair weather Christians. A southerly breeze always has to be uh, just courting you along, just swaying you. And you if, if there's any storm that comes up, well, you forget this, you're leaving. Not them. They said, look, we, we know, we believe. God can deliver us out of your, you ain't nothing, king. We're not even going to pray and fast about this. We're not going to answer you lightly. We're dead and determined. It's settled with us. We made a choice. We're going to serve God and only God. We're not going to serve your God. You made. It's not a God. And so we're not going to do that. So we're, we're, we want you to know we believe God will deliver us from you. But if not, we also want you to know we're never going to bow down to your little stupid little statue that's 90 feet tall of gold. He couldn't handle it. He lost it. Heat that blast furnace. Hit that melting furnace up there seven times hotter. Get those billows going, man. Get it white hot. Give me 4,000 degrees in there. Man, they went through those guys into that blast furnace, and literally those guys that threw them in there died from it. It was so hot when they threw them in there. And they fell down into the furnace. They fell down into the midst of the fire and got up and said, oh, I'm not tied up anymore. And God steps in there and says, good going, guys. You chose right. And they just talked. And that king, that mighty king, Looked into that door of that furnace. Didn't we throw three in there? Yeah. We threw three, right? There's four in there. There's somebody else in there. Mm. And he looks like the son of God to me. Oh, Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Come thou hither. Come on out, boys. It's okay. I think I'd have had fun with that. Oh, great king, you put me in here. If you want me, come in and get me. So they come out, and they're going, <laughs> sniffing them, and they're saying, and the king says, wow, your God's greater than me. He made my words nothing. There ain't no God like the God of Shadrach. Anybody that says anything against their God, I'll make a decree. We're going to cut him into pieces and make his house a dunghill. We're going to get rid of him. There ain't no God like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They chose to suffer, though. It was a choice. All the rest of the Hebrews ran out and chickened out. Look at look at uh, this wonderful harlot, Rahab the prostitute. What a wonderful lady. She heard a message secondhand and believed it. She didn't see it herself. She just heard what God did to the Egyptians and what God did to the kings that the Israelites fought against. And all the people were afraid. And she made a choice to save those two spies that Joshua sent in there. And she received her house saved because of it. It was dangerous. But she chose. It was a choice. The Bible says, by faith in Hebrews 11, the walls of Jericho fell down. You know, if you do some research on that, and I've read some commentary on it, and I look back to the original text, it, it's it's very possible that the walls literally just sunk straight down into the ground. God just de-elevated them. The elevator went down. And they didn't have a bunch of rubble of walls falling over to climb over to get into the city. God just made a sidewalk for them to cross the top of the wall. I mean, I think God could do that. He could just cause that ground underneath it just to 
start fluctuating and give way and the whole wall. But the only one that stood was Rahab, lit, her house stood on the wall and it was in the wall and that part of the wall stayed up. That's the only part that stayed ta- intact. So they just marched in there and conquered. And so the walls fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. That lady is in the lineage of Jesus Christ, a prostitute. Because she had faith. Look where faith will get you. If you will, lear- if you will learn to make a choice to follow God no matter what. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, trouble's going to come. You're going to go through some struggles in life. And you're going to think, well, how did I get here? I'm trying to do what's right. You ever feel that way? You feel like, man, I'm just trying to do what's right, God. I follow you, and all hell's coming down on me. Hey, <laughs> you're in good company. The Bible's full of faithful people like that. It's a choice. Moses had to choose to suffer with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It's a choice. You've got to make that choice. I can't make it for you. God won't make it for you. I wish... I can make choices for everybody, but it doesn't work that way. I choose you to serve God. I choose you to do what's right, but it don't work that way. We all have our own. But listen to this. Others, what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Oh, unbelievable. And Barak and of really Deborah should be there. And of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. What tremendous things, but sufferings. David, we studied David out in the scriptures, and you look at what he had to go through, and it's like, and he was anointed king. He was anointed king and had to run for his life and live in caves and had the king chasing him. He's fighting enemies of God, fighting the people of God, running for his life, and he was anointed. He had a promise on him, but he endured, didn't he? He didn't go back on God, and he didn't give up. And the, and the bottom line was God used him in a mighty way and made his kingdom sure forever, forever. David's kingdom is sure because Jesus is sitting on it. And so these faithful people, Hebrews tells us, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained the promises, stopped the mouths of the lion. Look at Daniel. Quench the violent fire, the, the Hebrew boys. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Wax valiant in fight. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Wow. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Miracles happened. But here, wow, that's in there too. Others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Who's the prime example of that? Jesus Christ. Our Lord set the example. He was tortured, brutalized, and didn't accept deliverance. He wanted it. But here's the choice. Not my will, Father. As a man, he didn't want to go through this. He knew what he was going to face. Who wants to suffer like that? Who wants to be put to death like that? It was one of the most feared deaths, the crucifixion of the time. Torture, beatings, ridicule, rejections. And then on top of all that, physical pain, to have all the guilt and shame of sin from the beginning to the end of the world, put on you. Oh, you ever do something wrong and feel guilty about it? Just one thing? How many has ever done that? How'd you like to have everybody's that ever lived and ever will live put on you? I can't even imagine the weight that that was. My mind can't even comprehend the burden that that was on the Lord. that we might obtain a resurrection. So 
God's not asked us to do anything that he wouldn't do first himself. That's what I like about him. You know, whether you like the president or not, they, they coined him as the blue-collar billionaire because he's just a down-to-earth guy that can gruff with the guys on the job and the steel workers and the heavy equipment operators and the truck driver. He relates to them. Jesus relates to us sinners. He can get down, down right next to us, and he's one of us. He was made like us. He's a human being just like us, only he triumphed. He was more than a conqueror. Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <laughs> because I live, you're going to live. Yeah. What a promise. He suffered for that, didn't he? It was a choice that he made. So the torture, the mockings, the cruelty, the scourgings, they, it goes on in Hebrews, it tells them they were sawed in two, uh, slain by the sword, afflicted, wandering, homeless. But the problem was not their lack of faith. It was their choice to do the will of God. Ask Jeremiah if it was fun being shoved down in a mud hole, down in a well, and so you just sink in the quicksand. He didn't get one convert, really. We had some of, some of the captives. Daniel followed Jeremiah's prophecy. But they hated him. They wanted to kill him. They brutalized him. They rejected him. When, he, when they asked him what the word of the Lord was and he told them, they, they rejected that. They, didn't, they said, whatever you tell us, that's what we're going to do. And then they don't do it. We want to know what God says. Oh, that. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we'll do whatever God says. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to live like that. I'm not going to do that. No way. Uh -uh. Okay, choice. Go ahead. Do it your way. I like what God says. We'll see who word stands. God says, mine are theirs. They said they're going to do this, but we'll see who wins on this one. I tell you who wins every time. God does. God knows the end from the beginning. We would be wise to follow him and not complain if the way gets rough. That was one of the great sins of Israel. Is they were murmurers and complainers. Man, in everything, Paul says, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is God's will that we give thanks. When it's bad out and it's storming, Give thanks. You know, that one song writer wrote, I asked the Lord to comfort me when things weren't going my way. Then he goes on in the song to say, I thank the Lord for everything. <laughs> he learned something. When he started looking through the song and he started seeing all that God gave him, and he turned his attitude around. Now instead of complaining about everything going wrong, I thank God for everything. Because God's only a, a prayer away. The answer's just right there. So we can trust God when the things don't. God does comfort us. He does carry us through. But it was, it's not the lack of faith. Moses and others made their choices by faith. By faith. And the faith did not depend on what they could see. Do you follow God by what you can see or what you don't see? Because if you follow by God by what you see, most likely you're not following by faith. Faith is saying, I follow God no matter what. It doesn't matter if the landscape looks good. Yeah, the way of the Red Sea was rough, and they started murmuring, God sent, man, you think it's rough now? Wait till these snakes come out and start biting you. Then you really got something to complain about. You ever have a child come to you, you raise children, start complaining? You, you want something to really complain about? You ever tell your kids that? I'll give you something to complain about. <laughs> what you're complaining about is nothing. And you, don't, you should be thankful, but you're complaining about, you know, I don't like this or I don't like You don't like food? <laughs> I never told my dad I didn't like it. I'd be on the floor <laughs> seeing stars trying to wake up. You put food on the table, you ate it, you thank, you were happy to eat it. If you said you didn't like something, you got a double portion or triple portion of that. You ate it, and you sat there until you ate it. And if you took too long, you got whipped, and you went back there and ate it anyways. Now, I'm not saying to be cruel and 
demeaning to your kids, but sometimes you look at your children and you say, do you really want something to complain about? I'll give you something to complain about. Sometimes I wonder if God doesn't feel that way. We got, he blesses us. He saves us. We're on our way to eternal home with him, and we want to whine and complain about some little discomfort we got here that really don't amount to a hill of beans. God help us all. Myself included. You got a little backache. Oh, well, you weren't sawn in two. I haven't resisted unto blood yet. Nobody's beaten me because I live for God. Faith. Faith is the substance, the material thing of things hoped for. It's exhibit A of things that aren't seen. I can't see it. I'm just hoping for it. That's faith. Faith is seeing something that's not real yet happening in God, according to the will of God. Not foolish thinking, but faith in the purpose of God. So faith is seeing your family saved. It's not. No matter how dark the, the day looks. <laughs> hey, I got a boy sitting in prison for murder, but he's saved right now. He called me, he texted me Sunday or, or Thursday, said I got out of a good apostolic service. It was awesome. Brother Kinsey's got a church going up there, services up there. And he's loving it. So 12 years I've been without an apostolic service, and I'm in one now. Faith. It might not have been my way of doing it. When I prayed that prayer, God, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, and I meant it, don't let him be lost. I didn't think a week later he'd be in prison for murder. But that night he prayed through to the Holy Ghost on a cell. Church was over there at Land of Lakes. And he prayed through to the Holy Ghost right there on the floor. 18-year-old kid, confused, scared, out of his mind, drug addict. God just, God wipes it, forgives it. You can't tell me God is not merciful. Don't you listen to the devil when he tells you you're not good enough for God. Don't you listen to that liar when he tells you you'll never be saved. All the forces of hell, a prison can't keep you from being saved. Don't give up, Mom. Don't give up, Dad. It looks bad now. The hurricane going on. Yeah, Irma came through. It looked like it was going to be worse than what it was. Thank God. It wasn't as bad as they thought. It always looks worse than what it is when you're with God. It not to mean it ain't bad, but the, the neat thing, Brother Harry, that bad things still work for good. How's that happen? Because I choose, I have the freedom to choose to follow God no matter what. Not by what I see but by what I know and hear and in his word. It's just not there. And so Moses, when he came to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He said, no, nah, I'm going to go out there and suffer with my people and deliver them and get them out of here. And they didn't want him. What a blow. He gave it all up for them, and they dissed him. They got rid of him. They didn't want him. They rejected him. And so he flees for 40 years. He's sucking his thumb, thumb and licking his wounds. He's been hurt and he's been rejected. And he, I thought I was in the plan of God. I thought it was. And give me just about two more minutes. Abraham, you're going to have a kid. <laughs> and it don't happen. And it don't happen. So God's needing some help. Man, that's where we get into trouble. 
Because when we're waiting for the promise to happen, good intentions, we want to help God out. You ever get yourself in a mess of trouble? because you try? I've done that. Got myself in a mess of trouble trying to help God out. Honest heart, honest mind. Is it wrong concept? God saying, no, I got a way of doing it. And you're not on that one. And so I don't even count that as nothing. And so when God's promise is fulfilled, Ishmael got to go. I love Ishmael. Ishmael got to go. That idea, that concept was bad. It's not going to work with what I'm doing because I'm not going to have a son and an heir to promise that's a child of a bondswoman. Oh, didn't think about that. So we have an allegory. Ishmael's the type of the law. Isaac's the type of Christ. Christ is so much better. God's promises, if we'll wait on him, he loves us. That didn't mean God couldn't use Abraham. That didn't mean God didn't use Abraham. He did in a mighty way. And he's the father. And matter of fact, your covenant with Christ is established in the covenant that was made with Abraham 4,000 years ago. As many of you as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore, you are Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. That's in your Bible. And so I don't care where you're at with your walk with God or what you think and what storm or not. And maybe everything's you're, you're, you're marching through the Red Sea right now in victory, watching, or you might be going through a dry spell, going through Horeb. It's dry in the desert. But wherever you're at, choose. You're free to choose. Choose Christ. Choose following Him. Choose giving your life to Him. Choose getting right with Him. Don't make excuses anymore. Get in it with all your heart. If you got knocked down, I've got knocked down. You've got knocked down. Get back up and fight. The promise is yours. The promise is unto you and your children. Hmm. Come on, your children got a promise on them. I don't care what the world's done to them or is doing to them. Your children will be saved. My children will be saved. It's immaterial. I may be in the grave when it happens. It's immaterial. But I know my God. And I know how much He loves me. And I know how much He loves my family. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my boys and their wives and their children... They'll be serving God if he tarries. And there's nothing that can shake me from that. Not even death will shake me from that. I don't need to see it. I already see it. It just hasn't arrived yet. So we need to stay in it. You need to believe God. Amen. Choose. Amen. I'm not saying it's going to be easy and there's not going to be struggles along the way and disappointments and heartaches and you're going to question again and wonder why, but you just keep hanging on there and keep believing God. And I'm telling you that God will see you through it and He'll see your family through it. He'll see your children through it. I don't know why I got on that, but I'm glad I did. Maybe because I was praying that today. Thanking God for my boys being saved. That's right. I don't care how perverse they've gotten. It doesn't matter what lifestyle they're in. It doesn't matter what crimes they committed. It doesn't matter to God. He can cleanse them in a moment if He wants to. He can move on their heart. And will receive them again. Just like nothing ever happened. He can restore. That's the thing about God. Our penal system releases people from prison and puts them on probation to see if they're going to be good. And if they're not, they throw them back in jail. I don't ever remember God putting anyone on probation. I love it. When, when you hear me, when God forgives you, you're forgiven. 
Just that simple. He don't bring it up again. Oh, the devil might bring it up. You might bring it up. God doesn't never bring it up again. He forgave you of it. It's gone. It's just like it never happened. He told Israel, I'll restore what the canker worm, grasshopper, I'll, I'll give it all back to you just like before. It'll be like nothing ever happened when you come back to God. You got a wayward child, a spouse. It's just that easy to come back. It's like it never happened. Your relationships, unless you don't want it to be, if you want to beat yourself up and say, oh, I made a mistake, well, who hasn't? Hello? Anybody perfect here? So, then I say, thank you, God. Thank you for mercy. And I accept it. I'm not going to reject it and say I'm not worthy. I know I'm not worthy, but you made me worthy. So I accept it, and I don't have any guilt now, for there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I don't have no condemnation. I'm free. I'm free indeed because he made me free. And all that he's done for me.